tell, I can tell that uh, vacation season has kicked off. There's less people here today, but that's all right. The Bible says we only need two or three, and we have met that requirement. We have well more than two or three gathered in his name, so we can worship. If you all want to stand up at this time and take a few minutes to uh, shake a hand, hug a neck, welcome somebody you haven't seen and you didn't get a chance to catch with them in the foyer, catch up in the foyer with them yet, I'll wrangle you back in in a minute and we'll pray and go into worship. You're allowed to walk around, I'm sorry. All right. Fewer people in the congregation, that means you just have to sing louder during praise and worship. That's, that's how that works, so we can hear you. All right, we're going to go into prayer, and then we're going to go into worship. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. We thank you for the people that are here. We ask that you... Bless them. We ask you that you bless those that are not here with us today. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do. We ask that you keep your hand upon our broken nation right now. Heal us, God. Bring us back together. And one way we can do that is sing to you and worship you, Lord. That's what we're here to do this morning. And we're here to raise you up. Because yours is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heal my heart. 
chapter 4 this week, and it talks about how our prayers should be earnest and diligent. And I don't know about you, but I definitely fail in that area. Um, but what better time than to start today? If you have any needs or anything that you'd like to pray about, our prayer partners are ready and willing to pray with you, and we welcome you to come.
this time, I get to come up and say a little something special because it's graduation time, and we have two graduates we want to recognize. Uh, normally, we bring them up on the stage and embarrass them a little bit, um, but since this year we have Andrew Heilman, he flat out said, if you do that, uh, I'm going to be sick that day and quite possibly burn the place down. So, I said, fine, fine, so, uh, but Andrew's doing a good job running our, our computer back there today. Um, so, we thank you, Andrew, congratulations. Andrew just graduated from Thomas Dale High School. I believe his plans are to start at the community college this fall. And he's going to, uh, if you don't know Andrew, uh, Andrew's fantastic at computers. It looks like that's what he's going to be doing with his career. Uh, and we're excited. Uh, I'm glad you're going to stick around for a couple of more years as well because uh, I, I need you back there, frankly. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a bit jealous, but we've, We've got a couple of gifts for you. One is uh, an every man's Bible. Uh, it's a Bible for every battle, every man faces. So uh, if you read this, Andrew, uh, it's going to do two things for you. It's going to bring you close. Well, more than two, but it's going to bring you closer to God. Put some hair on that chest, and it'll also attract all the ladies. So make sure you read that. But then we also got you an updated version of The Purpose Driven Life. This is one of those books that uh, I think is fantastic for so many people. Uh, if you're needing some direction, then, then that's one. And then we also have Miss Carly graduate at high school as well. And we're so excited for her. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I see Carly come in the door, I, I know it's going to be a good day at church. Um, you, you guys know everything their, their family, you know, just has challenges with. And so when they're coming to church, you know it's a good day and it's, and it's exciting. And, we're so thankful for uh, Kathy and Dave as well. Uh, they do so much around here that most of you don't even realize. If you if you find something new in the church and it's made out of wood, then nine times out of ten, Dave built it and just kind of came up with the idea and just went ahead and did it. So, um, Pastor Brian's just going to bring these back to you guys, uh, and then we're going to move forward. So, uh, before we get into the message today, I want to just thank you all. There are. Uh, I've been out the last two weeks. Two Sundays ago, I was asked to go preach for a buddy of mine uh, while he was doing a wedding. And then um, last week, uh, we got the news that the uh, virus that shall not be named hit the house. So uh, by the time that uh, I had to take a test, I was already feeling better. Uh, but we we had to do our time out and sit in the corner for a few days anyway. So, But I wanted to thank you all for Pastor Appreciation Day and everything that went on. Uh, if anybody said anything nice about me, then I appreciate you lying. And, um, I, I hope that comes back to you someday. But, the, but I, I appreciate the text and the phone calls. One final thing. I, I was away at camp meeting this week. This is where it used to be a lot of a lot more lay people used to go. We'd go to the campgrounds and be on an open-air tabernacle, and there'd be hundreds and hundreds of people. Over the years, it's kind of become more of like a uh, summer pastor's conference. And so... Um, I have a lot of good friends there that think a little too highly of me, and so there's been a lot of, there's been pastors retiring and things like that this year, and so they're all trying to poke at me and say, hey, where are you leaving, where are you going, and so I, I posted a little thing on Facebook as a joke, and apparently some people took it seriously, we're not going anywhere, um, it, we happen to drive by a church that could fit inside of our men's room called the Smallest Church in Woodville. And uh, I'm like, okay, this will get them to be quiet about it. And uh, I think it had the opposite effect. So um, for those of you that wanted us to leave, I apologize. To the rest of you, um, I love you too. So we are uh, we're continuing in our series. This summer we are uh, we're on a series called One Big Story. And I'm excited about it because uh, I hope my, my hope is that it drives us into the Word. I talk to so many people. Christians, people who have been living this life for years, and so much of my messages, whether it be adults, teenagers, or whatever, goes back to some of the basics of read your Bible and pray. And so I hope that this sparks an interest in the Word so that we can see, you know, how the different things in the Bible connect, how there's overarching themes, how some of that stuff in the Old Testament connects to the stuff in the New Testament. And, and how that applies to our lives. 
So if you haven't had a chance, I would really recommend that you go back the last couple of weeks on the website and on Facebook and watch those. But if that's not kind of your style, I'm going to give you a, a brief update, uh, just a quick quick little blurb on, on where we've been so far um, so that you're updated. So how many of those, uh, how many of us in here are like old school Church of God? Like you're not just Church of God, but you're Church of Magog. A couple of you, a couple of you are Church of Magog. Um, so if you are a good old Church of Magog folk, then... You've probably heard that we believe in the whole Bible rightly divided. That's that's one of our things. And so what that means is that we take all of it. We read the whole thing front to back. We study it. We get into it. We try to understand is, is this part literal or is this an allegory? Is this, you know, revelation or prophecy for the future? You know, how do we take the whole Bible and again rightly divide it so that we understand it and see how those 66 books kind of mesh together to create something that's not disjointed. And when you get into it that deep, it becomes this beautiful, beautiful work of Scripture that's so much more than just stories and, and little blurbs. It's, it really is just, just a, an amazingly beautiful thing. So in the beginning, uh, as Pastor Brian spoke about a few weeks ago, God spoke a few words. And when he did that, scientists explain it as a big bang. We know it as something different. But... God's words spoke creation into existence at the speed of 186 miles a second. It's amazing when you look at what it takes to do that. It could only have been God. And we start reading that in the, in the book of Genesis. And three chapters in, right after creation, man messes it up. And we get it wrong really, really quick. And so God just wants to walk in the garden with his people. He just wants to create Adam and Eve, love on them maybe play some video games, hang out, and he said, we can have this amazing relationship, but all you got to do is don't eat the fruit from that tree over there. And what they do? They ate the fruit from the tree. They sinned. They disobeyed. And so right at that moment, that's when this one big story comes in. It's this story of God trying to restore humanity into relationship with him. We see the fall. We see God coming after us again and again and again throughout the whole Bible. And even though Adam and Eve sin with their disobedience, God still cares for them. He gives them protection. He gives them sustenance. He gives them provision. But he also gives them a promise. And that promise is of what's to come. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to conquer evil. And he's going to restore all of us to himself. And he shows us early on that just because we sin, that's not the end of our story. Our failure isn't final and it isn't fatal because God is bigger than big and he's closer than close. And his grace is so much more extravagant, so much more beautiful than anything we can ever imagine. We also learn early on in the Bible that people are dumb. <laughs> Maybe stubborn's a better word. But sometimes I just kind of shake my head at what's going on in the Bible. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? You know, humanity continued just to, to get it wrong and we see Abraham come along. I think most of us heard about him. And God sees his love and his obedience towards him. And he tells Abraham, hey, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Your descendants are going to become a great nation. And Abe's like, what descendants? i got no kids. I'm 75. Where are they coming from? I mean, most 75-year-olds that I know are grandparents, maybe even great-grandparents. You know, and, and, and his wife hasn't been able to have kids. So he's like, uh, okay, what's going to happen here? And God, but God promised him this, and it eventually happens. And so we find out that God's promises rest upon his character. So the 25 years later, Abraham has Isaac, 100 years old, y'all. Can you imagine having a kid that old? Like, I'm 41, and I can't imagine having another one. Like, some of y'all are fantastic with that, but um, that, that's not for me. But we learn, what we learn about God from Abraham's life is this, and it's that the outcome of our lives isn't based on our abilities or our opportunities, but on our, on our obedience to God. So then we skip ahead a few hundred years. We see Abraham's descendants there in Egypt. They're slaves. It's estimated that there's over a million Hebrews that are enslaved in Egypt. And we have this epic showdown between the false gods of Egypt and the real God of the universe. Plagues were sent. And when the plagues came, it started to dismantle the religious system that was existing in Egypt. In 
And on the night of that final plague, we had the Passover. And God promised that if, you, if they would cover their door with the blood of the lamb, then the plague would pass over them. And so God was declaring that he is the one true God. And so as Abraham's descendants, those Israelites are leaving Egypt, God's declaring himself as good and faithful, and he's the one that will remain sovereign and deliver his people. And so God establishes a covenant with them. It's a promise. And I want you to remember that word promise as we continue through today and through this whole series, because you're going to hear that word again. But throughout those first five books of the Old Testament, God lays out his covenant. Think of it kind of as a promissory note. Anybody sign your life away to the bank at some point? Like you bought a car or you bought a house? You signed a promissory note. And that says, if you make your payments, when you're done making your payments, the bank promises to hand you the title of whatever it was that you bought. So think of the covenant that God makes is, if you do these things, then I will do and be these things for you. And so God in his covenant establishes his plan for his people. It's not just a set of rules. It's not just laws. It was meant to be a calling to live by because God's character was behind each and every one of those Ten Commandments. And even, but even though God's people saw so many miracles, they included the parting of the Red Sea, they still didn't trust him. So he made them live nomadically by wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. Sometimes we read that time in the wilderness after Egypt, and we're like, didn't they have a map? If you just draw a straight line, they could have been there in a month or so. But that's not what it was about. They knew how to get there. God was leading them around with a purpose. He had to work out the stubbornness from them as a whole, as a nation, through pain and through death. I once had a pastor's wife tell me a story, and she told me this, and this, this, this is going to sound harsh, so don't get mad at me. But she said, some things would never change in her church until some people just died. And I uh, know we knew who this person was, and the mouth dropped, picked it up off the floor. And I was like, okay, I'm not allowed to say that, but you are who you are. But that stuck with me. But, what, but it's very similar to what was happening with the Israelites. God, God is, had to just get, it wasn't just about getting them out of Egypt. God had to get Egypt out of them. So we move forward a bit, and we're under the leadership of Joshua and, and the judges. He gives, God gives the law. He sets up judges like Gideon and Samson and Deborah, and these are leaders of the community. Anything that is in any kind of public service, whether it be, you know, judicial law or even military leaders, political, religious, they, these judges, they, they were the people. And so, but during that book of Judges, we find that another generation is born, and they don't know the stories. They don't know what their ancestors went through. They don't know what it was like to have been brought out of Egypt and see all those miracles and know that God provided for their grandparents and great-grandparents. And so they lost their way. And the last judge of Israel was a guy named Samuel. I think most of us maybe heard of him as well. And the people of Israel come to him and say, Samuel, give us a king. They wanted to be like the other nations. All the other nations had a king. And so Samuel asked God, and God says, you know what, Samuel, go ahead and get more than one. And don't take it personal, Samuel. They're, they're, they're not mad at you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting you as God. So go ahead and, go ahead and give them what they want, and uh, the, the, we'll see what happens through this. God is sovereign. Yes, he is. And so we enter into the era of the kingdom of Israel. See, prior to that, God had established a, it established a theocracy. And this is different from the other nations of earth because the other nations had a person as the head of their government as the head of their nation and God said I am the head of Israel I am the head of the nation and so you know Samuel and the judges they were set up to hear from God and pass on what God wanted to happen and so Israel though they wanted to be like all the other cool kids on the playground all the other cool kids all the other nations they've got a king why can't we have a king and God says okay fine we'll give you one and so today we're going to take a look at those first four kings uh, that Israel's had. And you can read over those in the books of Kings and Chronicles. Uh, I, I personally, in my own devotions, recently finished the book of Kings, and I can tell you it's a, it can be a challenging book to read, but I would recommend it anyway, since you will see in there the history. It's kind of like, if you could read a yo-yo in, uh, in, in chapter form, it's what it is, because you see a good king and a bad king, and then a couple of good kings and a couple of bad kings, and it's little 
inconsistency in the leadership of Israel and what they're trying to do. And, and, and really, it, 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 it's, it's very similar to what we have sometimes in our, in our world today. But I, I'm, I'm not trying to wax political today. But the first king of Israel is a guy named Saul. And Saul comes around to reign in about 1050 B.C. And he's followed by David. Who's followed by his son Solomon. Who's followed by his son Rehoboam. And so we're going to look at them today and see where they placed their hope, how they responded to failure, and then what that means for us. Okay? And I read over these personally, and I wonder, how did God deal with such a flawed people? Like, I, I read some of the stuff, and I'm like, man, these guys are just complete clowns. You know? But this is how we read the Bible. We read it after the fact, and we read it from a different perspective of what happened back then. We want to put these guys into little categories of, you know, heroes and villains and good and evil and all those sorts of things, but aside from Jesus, everyone else in the Bible is kind of a mixed bag, aren't they? And so these are people that are born with this amazing God-given potential, but also with the propensity to sin. Just like all of us right here. And so God's story is one of a faithful God who pursues unfaithful people. It's a story of how he sovereignly uses these imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. And it's amazing how that unfolds throughout the Bible. So Samuel goes to Saul, he anoints him king, and Saul's name means asked for, which is very, very fitting because he was asked for by the people. And Samuel starts off, or I'm sorry, Saul starts off really well. In fact, we see in, in 1 Samuel 9, 2, we read that he stands head and shoulders above everyone else in Israel. He is very handsome, so he looked like a king. Kind of like the pastoral staff here. We're that good looking. We're all tall. Don't forget that. Yeah, wow, I didn't. I didn't come up here to lie to you. So Saul is appointed by Samuel. He's appointed by God. And he's popular with people. Everybody loves him. And he starts out so strong. He prophesies. And he has these amazing victories over other nations. And, and so you start out and it's like, man, this guy's got it together. And then things pretty quickly turn bad. In 1 Samuel 13, he's, he's facing a battle with the Philistines. And Samuel told him that, that he had to wait. Don't go into battle because what they would do traditionally is before a battle, they would have a sacrifice. And uh, Samuel or one of the other priests or judges would come and they would do a ritual sacrifice to pray to God that, they would, that he would bless the battle and that they would win. Well, Samuel's running late by about a week. And so Saul's getting itchy. You know, he's like, ah, I, I need to do something. You know, we're just here hanging out. The Israelites are getting scared. They're hiding in holes or they're hiding in tombs. You know, so you, you got to be real bad off if you're, if you're going to go in and hide with dead people. <laughs> Meantime, the Philistines, their army's growing. It's getting stronger. And so Saul's understandably, he's a bit nervous. He's starting to freak out a little bit. And so Samuel, like I said, after, after a week, he's not showed up yet. And so what we see in verse 8 is Saul waited for a total of seven days uh, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but then he starts to take it upon himself. And so as he's getting scared, Saul goes ahead and performs the sacrifice. He has the burnt offering, he does it himself, and Saul takes matters into his own hands. Because Saul had become so accustomed to his position and his power and his authority, and then he stepped outside of those bounds. And so when Samuel confronts him about it, Saul's, Saul's reaction is it's so arrogant. He's like, well, you know, you didn't show up, so I figured I'd just do it myself. Turns it around on him. Well, I just kind of had to do it. You know, I'm the guy in charge. You didn't show up. You didn't do your job, so I'd do your job for you. He misused his authority. He stepped into a role that wasn't his to offer a sacrifice that he wasn't authorized to make. Then we jump ahead a couple more chapters, and in 1 Samuel 15, Saul's facing the Amalekites. And Saul now shows a, an even further blatant disregard for, for God's battle plan. Because when, when God said wipe out, wipe out all the people and wipe out all the livestock, and Saul doesn't do that. Saul keeps the livestock, and then again when he's confronted with, from, with, by Samuel about it, we, we get another similar reaction. So you would think that he'd learn his lesson, but in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel responds this way. Verse 22, Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, 
your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. So we have this blatant disregard for the authority of God. And when he's faced with that failure, here's his response. Saul pleaded with him again. I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Saul's not really sorry for what he did. He's not repenting at all. He's just sorry that he got caught. And then he's got enough gall to ask Samuel, well, will you at least uh, make me look good in front of the people? Like, really? <laughs> you know? And so then the saddest part is we read that then the spirit of the Lord left him. Man, how sad. You go from like being the chosen one to the spirit of the Lord leaving you. He turns from this prophetic man into a psychotic ruler who is intimidated and always on guard. He's in a position that God called him to, but without the presence of God in his life. The last place that we want to be is in a position that God has not called us to, but equally concerning is to be in a position that God has called us to, but without his presence in the midst of it all. Saul got ahead of God's presence. Remember how Moses wouldn't go anywhere unless God's presence was with him? Big change. So often, we have a problem of either getting ahead of the presence of God, lagging behind the presence of God, but what we really need is to when we're called to be something and be somewhere, to be in the presence of God. And so Saul faced this problem of misused authority because he, he put his hope in his position. And when he faced failure, he responded with a desperate cry to save things and save his reputation. And because of that, he lost the throne. And so then what we learn about God from Saul's story is this. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Being obedient to the voice of God is more important than some kind of religious activity just to impress other people. Serving others begins with serving him. And so this, this hits hard, I think, for a lot of us that are in ministry because it's easy to just kind of do the things that are involved in church work sometimes and forget why we're doing it. You know, we can you know, lose the heart behind what we do. I don't want to miss out on God because I'm working for God. Does that make sense? So we move ahead to 1 Samuel 16, and Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and he's there to anoint a new king. God led him there, and so Saul's still on the throne, but everybody's kind of realizing, you know, this isn't going to work out. You know, we're going to have to do something different with this whole king thing, and so Samuel goes to Jesse's house, and Jesse lines up, you know, all but one of his sons, and they're all good looking, and they're strapping boys, and, you know, Samuel's there, and he's not hearing from God about any of them. And, and so he's like, is this all you got? Like, do you, do you have any more kids around? And, and Jesse's like, yeah, you know, I, I got this run out in the field. He's watching, he's watching sheep. Uh, you you want to talk to him? And so Samuel's like, yeah, let, let, let's get him. Bring him in. Let me take a look at him. And that's when God says, that's the one. And so now we're introduced to David. David's name means favorite or beloved. And that's also very fitting because he ended up being the most popular king in the history of Israel. The most celebrated, all of that. So at this moment, David goes back to watching the sheep. He was anointed king, but he takes his position as a humble shepherd until the day comes that he goes into a battlefield. He's there. He's trying to bring some food to his brothers. They're out fighting the Philistines. This is where we see the story of Goliath come in. And David shows up. And David's like, who is this guy up here? Why is he out here taunting you guys and making fun of you? Why are y'all scared? And so he goes to King Saul and he says, look, I think I can take care of this punk. You know, I, I, I deal with worse than this while I'm out here tending sheep. And in 1 Samuel 17, 36, we read this. David says, I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he's defied the army of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Listen to that. The Lord who rescued me. David didn't put his trust or his hope in his resume, or his accomplishments, his experience, or even his skills with a sling and a, and a rock. David ended up being this incredibly flawed man, but his hope was always anchored in God. He never, ever wavered from that, no matter what he did. So he defeats Goliath, and then he actually spends... 
many years in Saul's service until Saul starts becoming jealous. And so then he's become, getting all these accomplishments. He's becoming popular. He's becoming the cool kid in class. You know, and Saul's not doing so hot. And Saul, Saul gets jealous. And Saul was actually trying to kill David. He was, he was on a mission to find and kill David. And we read that David actually had two opportunities to kill Saul instead. But he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to touch God's anointing. I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny when you read in the Bible, Saul's in a cave using the bathroom and doesn't realize that David's hiding back here in the dark. David just could have run up and stabbed him while he's doing his business and take care of it. But he didn't. I'm not going to touch God's anointing. And he says this, he says, God will elevate me when time is right. And so eventually David did come to the throne. He ruled from about 1010 B.C. to 970 B.C. And under his reign, Israel thrived. David became a poet, a musician, a warrior, a king, a political leader. He, he brought all the, all the different tribes in Israel together under one heading. They were a loose confederation of tribes before he came in. And then now with David, they become like a major uh, world superpower. He wrote up job descriptions for priests and Levites. He drew up plans for the temples and he wrote 70 psalms. He conquered the Philistines. He conquered Jebusites, the Syrians, the Moabites, the Ammonites. And he expanded Israel's territory by a factor of 10. A lot of military skill, a lot of diplomacy. And in his poetry, we find David's passion. In his writings, we find what was underneath all this guy. But it was this misdirected passion that got him into trouble. One night he's standing on the rooftop, and he's looking out. And there's a good-looking lady over there, and she's taking a bath. Don't ask me why they took baths on the rooftops. I don't have the answer to that. And David likes what he sees. And he calls for her to come on over. And they get to business. And she gets pregnant. I always read this, and I wonder... Who does this guy think he is? Like, he's already married. And, and, and does she just have to, like, put up with it because he's the king? Like, does she just, like, I, I, I don't understand that. Like, today we hear so much about consent. And there it's just like, man, he just called for her and, you know, this, this just happened. But he's king. And so this happens. And, of course, she gets pregnant. And so David gets upset. And, uh. And he's trying to hide it. He wants to cover it up. So he calls for Uriah, who was her husband. He calls her back from the battlefield. He's hoping Uriah's going to come home. Uriah's going to have a good time. Uh, they'll think the baby is Uriah's. But Uriah's a stand-up guy. And Uriah says, no, I can't go home and have a good time while all my men are at the front of the battlefield. And so David, again, trying to cover everything up, sends Uriah to the front of the battle where it's known that he, he won't make it. And that's exactly what happens. So Uriah dies. David takes Bathsheba to be his wife, and so the cover-up begins, and David thinks he's, he's home free. We'll just call this baby premature. And it seems like everything's going to go well, and David's going to get by with it until the prophet Nathan shows up and confronts him about it. We find David's passion was misdirected, but we find in Psalm 51 how he responds to that, to that failure. He says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal or a right spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So David faced failure, but he responded with a desperate desire to restore his relationship with God. And at that moment, his misdirected passion caused a snowball effect in his family, unfortunately. And it creates this cycle of escalating sexual sin and murder. His kids turn against one another. You know, one of his own sons, Absalom, eventually turns against him and tries to usurp, you know, him and, and cause a rebellion. That one moment of misdirected passion in David's life ruined his family. But God also gave him a promise. He said, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel forever. And it's a peculiar promise because as we move on in the Old Testament, before we get to the New Testament, we... We find out that the, the kings, this whole thing of kings starts to fade. King David struggled with misdirected passion, but his hope was always anchored firmly in the Lord. His response to failure was a desperate desire to restore that relationship. He lost his family, but he gained a promise. And so what we learn about God from David's life is this. God will elevate us to the position he wants us to have if we will posture ourselves in humility before him. 
Well, after David, his son Solomon comes to the scene. Solomon's name means God is peace. Again, very fitting for this season because they were in peacetime. They were no longer at war. And so Solomon also starts off very strong. He has a dream and God appears to him in the dream and says, you can ask for anything. How many of y'all would like that? You know, we read that and we expect him to say, you know, I'd like a million dollars or, you know, I'd like the lovely woman over here. No, he didn't. But Solomon wishes for wisdom. And God's so impressed with that that he honors that request and gives Solomon wisdom, but also gives him all the other things. He says, I'm going to go ahead and bless you with all this other stuff as well. And we find that Solomon's reign was marked by four things, and all four things start with a W. It was wisdom, wealth, writings, and women. He was incredibly wealthy. His annual income was 25 tons of gold, and that didn't even include trade. And so I had to do a little Googling to find out what that means. So um, we're, we're going pre-pandemic here on, on free inflation. But one ton of gold in 2019 was worth over 46 million American dollars. Solomon's annual income today would be around one billion one hundred fifty million dollars. That's I just need to work for a year with this guy. I'm good. So Solomon lost this massive building project, the temple, you know, a whole lot of else, other things. The temple took seven years to build, and it's a place for God's presence to dwell in the middle of Jerusalem. He builds a palace that takes 13 years to build. But he taxed the people very, very highly for his extravagant lifestyle. He was also a prolific writer. He wrote the Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. And then there's the women. I'm fleshing his wisdom on this, but 700 wives and 300 concubines. A thousand of them. Now Solomon did this because he was trying to bring peace to you know, to his nation. And so what this is, is he's forming alliances with other countries and with other foreign kings. And so he agrees to marry their daughters so that, you know, this would kind of help maintain peace for this empire that he's building. The problem is that all these women that he married start to bring in their own false religions. And then this starts to have a terrible impact on the people of God. All right. We read in 1 Kings 11. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely, as his father David had done. So let's pause here a minute. Let's talk about idolatry. We think it's something that we don't really have to deal with today because we could probably go in most of our houses and we don't have little trinkets made of gold or wood or some other kind of metal. And, you know, we, we probably don't have little shrines in the corner of our homes and we probably don't bow down and worship these little animal shaped trinkets and things like that. But idolatry is more than that. It's not just that those kind of little idols. It's about, it's about where you place your status. It's more than about where you go to worship. It's about putting God first in your life. Solomon never completely turns his back on God. He just didn't follow God completely. So when you think about idolatry in that way, we have to think about all the things in our lives that we put before God. And some of them are good things. It could be your significant other. It could be your job. It could be your hobby. All of those things become an idol in our lives when we put them before God. Solomon was just trying to cover his religious basis here. It wasn't outright re rejection of God, but it did show a lack of faith in Jehovah. So do we trust God, or are we just trying to add stuff to give ourselves an edge? You know, do we, do we like Christianity, but maybe there's something over here in this other religion that sounds good, so maybe I'll take that and sprinkle it in here, and, you know, just, just in case, you know? Because, you know, I don't really have time to read my Bible, but I saw somebody make a nice tweet about something, so maybe I'll just take that and sprinkle it into my faith and 
see if that works. It sounds cute. So here's a few questions to ask yourself in order to see if there's idolatry in your life. First, to whom or what do I look for value? Who assigns me value? Or what assigns me value? Where do I find safety and refuge, comfort and security and shelter? Who must I please? Whose opinion counts? Who gets the final call on decisions in my life? Where do I place my trust? If the answer to any of these questions is anything other than God, then we are guilty of idolatry. It's not just enough to worship and trust God, but you have to worship and trust God alone. Solomon had a problem with misplaced trust because his heart had turned to idolatry. And even though he's trying to keep peace for his kingdom, what we find is this Solomon reacted to this failure, the way he reacted to it, it's actually a little bit unclear. But he writes in the book of Ecclesiastes, and, and it's kind of thought that maybe Ecclesiastes is this reaction to his own life. And Ecclesiastes 1.1 opens up with this. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. That's not indicative of false religion. I don't know what it is. So some people will read this and they'll, they'll see disillusionment, despair, depression. Others argue that this is coming from a place of real truth that he's discovered. He's understanding that nothing except complete dependence upon God makes life worth living. But regardless, Solomon loses his way. He faced the problem of misplaced trust because he put his hope in his alliances and in his diplomacy. And it's his response to failure that's unclear. It's probably a mix of all those things. It's probably a mix of, you know, depression and all those sorts of things. But hopefully, maybe there's in there some dependence on God. We don't really know. But because of this, he lost his way. And we learned through Solomon's life, we learned that King Solomon, or from him, that God refuses to share his throne with anything or anyone. We have to examine who we've placed on the throne of our own lives. So then after Solomon comes the fourth king, this is Rehoboam. He comes to the throne, and in 1 Kings 12, we start to find his rise. And Rehoboam's name means he enlarges his people. Now, this was not indicative of Rehoboam's reign, because the only person that Rehoboam sought to enlarge was himself. So he steps onto the scene, and he's confronted by people who asked him to reduce the taxes and alleviate the labor laws that his father Solomon put into place. Solomon, remember, taxed them very hard, a lot of labor laws, he's trying to do all this kingdom building. And so Rehoboam goes to his father's advisors and asks them, what do you think I should do? And his father's advisors say, hey, Rehoboam, um, you know, we're in peacetime, you know, you, your father lived really extravagantly, we don't really need, you know, all this, like, do you really need a billion dollars a year? But he didn't listen to them. He, Rehoboam goes and talks to his buddies. And, and, and we sometimes know how young guys and egos are. And so they, they kind of puff up his ego a little bit. And, and they say, who are these people to ask you to lower their taxes? You should probably make it even worse on them. And so Rehoboam likes that. That, that feels good for a moment because that makes Rehoboam you know, puffed up. And so what's interesting is that Rehoboam doesn't consult God in any of this. He's the first king so far that does not consult God in all of his leadership. And then we see a guy named Jeroboam. Jeroboam has served for Solomon as the secretary of labor. And Jeroboam launches a revolt. And the result of that is that 10 of the 12 kingdoms or tribes of Israel revolted with him. And that's where we see the split of the kingdom into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Rehoboam faced the problem of misguided counsel because he puts his trust in his hope and his friends. And because of that, his response to failure was defiance. And he lost the kingdom pretty quickly. After Jeroboam's revolt, the kingdom of Israel, again, it splits in two. It exists as two separate kingdoms. Sometimes they're at war, sometimes they're at peace. But they each have their own religion, they each have their own king. And during those first few years of Israel's kingdom, those four kings were on the throne. We have a prophetic man who turns psychotic. We have a humble shepherd and a mighty warrior who turns into an adulterer and a murderer. We have a wise temple builder who turns into an aimless, wandering idol worshiper. And then we have a young guy who's just kind of trying to figure it all out and doesn't get it. And what we learn from their stories is that 
their success and failure really didn't have anything to do with their skills or their abilities or their opportunities. It had everything to do with their obedience, their humility, and their worship. And the other thing that we see from all these stories is this, is that God still works in spite of the weakness of those people. I hope that comforts you today. Because <laughs> even though kings were weak and the kings failed, God's kingdom still moved forward. Remember that promise that God gave to David that his descendant will sit on the throne forever? We kind of know the end of the story of this, but eventually the northern kingdom, it didn't even have David's descendants on it. The northern kingdom was being defeated by the Assyrians and exiled, and eventually the southern kingdom was uh, where the, the descendants of David would sit on the throne, and they were defeated by the Babylonians and exiled. And so, but God said to David that his descendant, he's going to sit on, he's going to sit on the throne of Israel forever. But about a thousand years later, spoiler alert, an angel shows up to a young girl named Mary, gives her some interesting news. We're reading Luke 231. The angel tells her this, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never the kingdom may have forgotten his God, but God did not forget his kingdom. Amen? We're going to end a little differently today. You know, this is a different kind of message series. We're, I'm not going to have anybody come up and play. We're not going to pray or anything like that. I'm going to encourage you all to be here in two weeks. Be here next week. But in two weeks, Pastor Brian will be back. He's going to pick up where we left off and continue with one big story. Next week, we've got a special speaker. We've got our own Thomas Ryder who's going to come up. And he's going to bring a special word. And I really want to encourage you all to be does a fantastic job and um, we just, just love and appreciate Thomas. So let's all go ahead and stand. We're going to close with our benediction scripture and then I'm going to let you all go outside and dance and marry. All right. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Thank you all. Y'all have a wonderful week. Be safe out there.